about you, but I don't know about you, but sometimes I am amazed at how the human mind works. 20 plus years ago, I was in a biology class where a professor, and this wasn't the main point of the lecture, the professor mentioned that the reason people often get stomach ulcers is a bacteria named Helicobacter pylori. 20 years ago, a professor mentioned that in a lecture, and it has been stuck occupying space in my brain ever since. If you ask me how old I am, sometimes I have to stop and do the math. Like, I have to think, how, when was I born and what year is it? But Helicobacter pylori has been stuck in there for 20 years. Sometimes I will call my kids by the wrong names. I can almost never remember when their birthdays are. But H. pylori, I will never forget. Sometimes our minds work in some strange ways. Ten years ago, I had a pastor who asked me to work on a new members class. And, and I started working on a new members class and I started trying to put it together and he gave me a stack of papers that was about 10 inches thick and after four years I had a stack of paper that was about 14 inches thick but I still didn't have a new members class. But I tell you the thing that stuck in my head and trying to go through all of that material and trying to uh, form this idea of what does it take to be a church member, what does it take to become a, a fully formed disciple of Christ? I tell you, the thing that stuck in my head was trees. Trees and vines stuck in my head. Today, I'm going to get it out of my head, and I'm going to put it into your heads. And I hope that 20 years from now, it'll still be there, bouncing around with Helicobacter pylori and, and your telephone number of your best friend from when you were growing up and those other things that it's just stuck in there, that it's in there, and that it not only is in your mind, but that it's bearing fruit in your life. This morning, we're going to start a sermon series. It's called TBD, which is the abbreviation for To Be Determined, which is in part, it's called that because we could not come up with a title. Yeah, and some of our ideas were really bad. I'll, maybe later on I'll let Rusty share some of those with you because, uh, yeah, the funniest ones were his. But, um, yeah, but today it's TBD, and here's why. And that is that today I'm going to start a series where we're going to talk about discipleship and disciple-making. And six weeks from now, I'm going to ask you if you will agree with me on three things. I'm going to ask if you'll agree with me in three things, and there, there are things that I think that our church should adopt. Um, there are three sort of changes or clarifications that I'd like for our church to make, and in particular, here they are. I'll tell you ahead of time. I don't want to surprise anybody. Now, these are things that aren't the sort of thing where this committee needs to vote on it, and then it's sent to this committee and this committee. These are some things that the church staff and I have talked about some things that we've talked to the, to the uh, deacons about, that we've talked to the church council about, and, and, but we are not making this decision. Amos, in the Bible says, how can people walk together unless they are agreed? And so I want us to agree. And so over the next several weeks, I'm going to cast a vision for these three things. One is that we would have a church motto, that we would have a phrase that people would say, oh yeah, North Orange Baptist Church, they are the church that blank. That that should be our identity is who we are, but it's also our mission, our program of, of who we are. The second would be a, a church uh, program of spiritual development or a discipleship strategy, and it's going to be built around a tree. And the third is a new church logo, which is on, on the screen behind me. And I'll go ahead and tell you part of it now, how, what it sort of means. The first, at a first glance, it is an orange because we live in a town called Orange, and we go to a church called North Orange, and the center part is like the arrow on a compass, because our church isn't just Orange Baptist Church, it's North Orange Baptist Church. But there's more to this than just meets the eye, and we'll kind of unpack that over the next several weeks. But I'm gonna ask you to agree with me on these. I'm not, see, there's sometimes that People will be in a leadership position, and they'll say, okay, I, am, I know what we need to do. Here's what we need to do, and so here's what we're going to do. That's not me. Some of you have come to me, and you've said, Brother Chip, we need to change this and this and this. And, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
that's not, that's not, that's not me. I'm not the kind of person who wants to come in and just like start changing a lot of things without first casting a vision for it, which is what we're going to do, Brother Rusty and I are going to do for the next several weeks. We're going to cast a vision for it. And at the end of that, I, I hope that we are all agreed so that we can walk together because as we have prayed about this, as we have sought godly counsel on this, everything after 10 years of, of it bouncing around in my brain, it seemed to find a home in just in the last two months and everything kind of clicked together. But it starts with understanding what does a disciple look like. When I was in the interview process, one of the things they said is that we have changed from a model to be an attractional church to be a missional church. And am I, is my voice really loud to y'all? I'm getting a lot of bounce back on, on me. Brad, can you bring me down just a little bit? It's the change from being an attractional church. Now here's, here's an attractional church. Let me give you a, a picture of it. If we wanted to be an attractional church and to grow as an attractional church, every week we could do a $100 gift card drawing. Like we could draw a pri for a prize. You would look under your pew. Don't bother looking under your pew. There's nothing there. There's no nothing there. I have not put out anything for you this week. If that was an attractional church, maybe we'd do that. You know, every, Once a year, we'd give away a free car. Every week, we could broadcast a motivational speaker from Houston. Just pretend there was one. Some guy with a really, you know, a pretty wife and a really nice smile. Um, we could broadcast his, his talks um, every week, and we would invite people here, and we would ask nothing of them. We would not ask for any life change. We would instead, we would promise them health and wealth and prosperity. And you know what? People would be drawn to that. They'd be attracted to it because it's an attractive thing. That's not our model. Our model is almost the opposite of that. Our model, instead of me putting on a goofy grin and giving good news, sometimes I'm going to teach hard truths. Sometimes I'm going to say things that are very difficult. This morning I had to teach 2 Corinthians, where Paul talks about how our afflictions bear an eternal weight in glory. That's hard, friends. That to know that we are afflicted, but we have a Father who could heal us, but he withholds that healing in the short term for an eternal healing. That's, that's hard. That's kind of tough to wrap your minds around, but that's the gospel, and that's what we preach here. We could, we could do that attractional thing, but we don't. We don't ask nothing. Instead, we, to be a disciple is to ask everything. Instead, to be a disciple doesn't promise health and wealth. It promises persecution. It promises affliction. And that is our model. And that's why I would like for us to see first a motto that is that North Orange Baptist Church is growing disciples. Growing disciples. But to get there, let's talk about what a disciple looks like. This morning we're going to look in Psalm chapter 1. In the very first Psalm, I think that this is a beautiful picture of what a disciple looks like. In Psalm chapter 1, this Psalm begins this way. It said, blessed is the man. And I didn't do it justice just then because my microphone's on. Can you, can you cut my mic for one second? Right, it's, it has, it carries that sort of excitement. Here's how, I, here's how I try to think of it. Have you ever known a secret or a surprise? Like maybe you knew your brother was about to ask his girlfriend to marry him, and you see her, and you see him. Oh, and you're just bursting, like you want to say something. And she, like, she says something funny, like, oh man, you know, things sure are changing. And you're like, oh, you don't know. You don't know, like it's so. That's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, You think you're blessed. Oh, you don't know. You don't understand the supreme happiness that is yours. This isn't just a little blessing, it is a massive blessing of righteousness. He says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor st stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. That's a progression there. It's a progression there. It goes from walking to standing to sitting. It goes from the wicked to the sinner to the scoffer. It's, it's a progression. I don't know if you've, ever, if you've ever thought about this, but there are certain conversations that you can't have while walking. Right? Like there are certain conversations you can't have while walking where you're like, oh, how are you today? Good. That's fine. Nice. All right. See you later. Right? You wouldn't be like, your test results came back. Yeah, you're going to need a new liver. Right? That's not... That's not a conversation you have while walking. So this idea of walking, it's a progression in saying that this is a small 
connection. This is a, a, a small connection. It's saying not to walk according to the counsel of the wicked. Now, the wicked in Scripture, it's, it means ungodly. Like, we use wicked as being like a really awful thing. But in the Old Testament way of, of understanding, to be wicked means that you're ungodly. To be wicked means it's, that's me and you before Jesus. Before Jesus, you and I were wicked. We were wicked. We did not know God. And so it says, do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, it doesn't say, it doesn't mean that you can't have relationships with people who are ungodly. It doesn't mean that you can't even walk with people who are ungodly. You don't walk the way they want to walk. They walk the way you want to walk. You don't let them set the terms of your relationship. You set the terms. You say, if, if you and I are going to walk together, I'm not going to agree to your ungodliness. You're going to agree with my godliness. You're going to agree with, with my way of walking. And then it progresses to say, don't stand in, in the council of, of, or so don't stand in the way of sinners. To be sinner isn't just to be ungodly. That's to be like in defiance of God. That you, that you know God's will, but you reject it for yourself. It says, don't, don't stop and have conversation with, with those people. Don't let those people pour into your lives, those people who are living in rejection of God's will. And then the last one is, don't sit in the seat of scoffers, which is a beautiful alliteration. Sit in the seat of scoffers. Right? Don't, don't sit in the seat of scoffers. Don't, don't sit down at the table with a scoffer because to be a scoffer isn't just to be ungodly. It isn't just to reject God's will for your life. It is to criticize. It is to belittle. It is to, to talk down everything about the Lord. You know people like that? Yeah. We know people like that. And, and you don't want to let those people be a primary influence in your life. We are to reject the scoffer. Other, some translations will call a scoffer a mocker. We reject those people. We don't, we don't live with those people. That is not the will of God for us. But instead, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. His delight is in the law of the Lord. That's how he recognizes who is wicked. It's how he understands who's a sinner and who's a scoffer. Because he first, he understands the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. And that is what tells us how to walk. That's what tells us how to stand. That's the thing that we, that we gather around when we sit. That is our guiding influence, the law of the Lord. And on that law, we meditate day and night. This is what, this is what one commentator said about the Word of God in this passage. It says, the Word of God is never far from the thoughts of the saint of God. When he is depressed or distressed, he calls to mind its promises. When he is uncertain or perplexed, he considers its guidelines. When his sins loom before him like evil specters, he ponders its glorious proclamation of the love of God in and through Jesus Christ. He finds the word of God has a joy for every sorrow and a truth for every situation. This is the picture of a disciple this is what it looks like to be a disciple, one who meditates on the law of the Lord night and day. Question, where do you meditate on the law of the Lord? I don't know if you are, are on social media. I, I know that on Facebook and Instagram, this became a thing a few years ago where, and I, I don't mean to pick on ladies, but it seems like it's mostly ladies that they will post this picture where it's like, Here's my Bible and my highlighter and my coffee. You know the ones? Some of you are guilty of this, yeah. And, and it's like, you know, lead, reading my scripture today, right? Or, or here's, I, I really like this one because it makes my point much more effectively. Um, I like the one where somebody's like, my quiet time today, and it's like a picture of the ocean or of sun rising over this impossibly beautiful hill. Right, or they're on their back porch looking out at like cattle or something really pretty, right? And, they, and that, that's where they're meditating. I almost, in fact, I have never seen anyone, you can accept this as a challenge this week, I have never seen anyone post a picture of themselves in line at the DMV saying, reflecting on God's goodness, right? <laughs> never. That never happens. Because there's something inside of us that when we want to get close to our Creator, we dwell in his creation. 
We dwell in his creation when we want to get close to the creator. And so it is, it is throughout scripture we see a connection between, in fact, I would say that throughout scripture, in fact, let me, let me read the, very, the start of the next first, first verse. When he describes what a disciple is like, he says he is like a tree planted by streams of water. He is like a tree. He's going to describe a disciple of the Lord figuratively as a tree. And there's a reason for that. And that is because throughout Scripture, the most common way that a disciple, a child of God, is described figuratively in Scripture is having a connection to a vine and a tree. Probably the first place in Scripture that we see this really vividly is in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25. 1 Kings 4, 25 says, And Judah and Israel lived in safety. Now let me give a little background real quick. In this passage, it is describing the height of Solomon's kingdom. It talks about all of the area that he influenced, the different kingdoms that sort of bowed to Solomon's influence. It talked about how wealthy he was, how many heads of different types of cows were slaughtered each day just to feed his palace, right? It, it talks about the height and depth and breadth of his kingdom, but the pinnacle of it, as it's describing the most significant part of Solomon's kingdom, it's this, verse 25, they lived in safety from Dan even to Beer. Sheba, Eve, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, all the days of Solomon. It's saying, listen, if you want to see the beauty and the majesty of Solomon's reign, it is this, that people were connected to the Father under a vine and under a fig tree. And that, that same imagery is used again and again. That's not the first place we get a picture of that image, no. The very first place is at the very beginning. When we look at the story of Adam and Eve, as God walked with Adam in, in the dews of the morning, as he, as he walked with Adam, where was he walking? He was walking through the trees. He was walking through in the shade of the trees of the Garden of Eden. God was spending time with Adam. He meditated on God's word with God in the shade of trees. We see it again in, in the prophets. We see it again in the prophets where Micah in chapter 4, verse 4, when he describes the nations all coming to the mountain of God, every nation coming to God to celebrate God, to celebrate the good news for all the nations. He says this, but, after they, after, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. That there will be a connection to the Father in that time, not a time that Micah lived through, but in a time that Micah prophesied. This is in the age of the church. This is in the age of Christ. This is in the age to come, that there will be peace like never before, and they will understand that peace because they will be in the shade of a fig tree and of a vine. When Zechariah wanted to describe, he describes in chapter three, he describes that how the sin of the world will be taken away in one day that all of the sins of all of creation will be taken away through one act of atonement. Zechariah didn't fully understand what he was even talking about at that point. He didn't understand who Jesus was going to be. He couldn't have understood the atonement completely, but he says it'll all be taken away in one day. And how will they recognize it? In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine, under his fig tree. But it's not just there. We see it in the New Testament too. When, when Jesus wants to give a sign of God's displeasure with Israel and that this a sign of his displeasure with the religious leaders in Jerusalem, he walks up to what? A fig tree. And he curses the fig tree and it dies the next day. When he says, no, we're gonna give it more time, what does he use as a symbol? He uses a, a fig tree. When he calls Nathaniel, talk about meditating on the scriptures. When he calls Nathaniel, and Nathaniel comes to Jesus. Nathaniel has questions. He has some, some reservations about following Jesus because Jesus is from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I think Nazareth may have been like the Port Arthur of, of that part of the world. I'm not sure. And I'm not from here. I'm just telling you what y'all say. Anyway, um, but he says, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Jesus says, man, Nathaniel, I saw you while you were still under that fig tree. Why was he under a fig tree? he was looking for connection to his heavenly father because the scriptures tell us that connection to the vine connection to the fig tree is connection to god that that's the symbol of being a disciple is through connection to that tree he says i saw you when you were under that tree and man and nathaniel he's amazed he's floored that jesus knew that he was under a fig tree and jesus says stick around man stick around because you haven't seen anything yet throughout scripture 
The connection of, of God to his people is through this vine, through this tree. That is the symbol that is used again and again and again. And so in Psalm 1, in verse 3, he says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. He's like a tree, we covered that, planted in by streams of water. Jesus talked about this very thing as he talks to the woman at the well and he says that he wants her to get him some water and she, he says, no, I'm gonna give you some water. I'm gonna give you living water and when you drink it, you'll never go thirsty again. That's the water. That's the water that we plant our lives in, that living water that we understand through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, but we only come to know through the Word of God. That living water that we are planted in through the Word, by the Spirit, that living water nourishes us. It keeps us. It keeps us to the point that he says that he grows his fruit in its season and his leaf does not wither. Now, the leaf represents simply life. Here we have a living orange tree. I haven't named it yet. My kids will probably come up with a name for it soon if nobody else does. No, put your hand down, son. <laughs> but this is an orange tree, and I'm not an arborist, so don't, please don't ask me to come and tell you about the health of your trees. But to me, this tree looks alive because the leaves are green. A month from now, that may not be the case, especially if I am left in charge of caring for this tree. That was a plea for volunteers. Anyway. <laughs> But this tree is alive, and we see that life because of, of the color. Its leaves are here. The Word of God sustains our lives. The Word of God sustains our lives, not just, not just for these 70, 80, 40 years that we have here, but it sustains our lives into eternity. That that Word of God, it pushes us from, from life into life everlasting. That's what the Word of God does for us, and so our leaves do not wither. But then there's this other thing, that it, it bears fruit in its season. Obviously, this tree has no fruit. Some of you this morning, you may look at your life, and you may feel like you just don't have any fruit. There may have been a time in your life when you look back and you say, man, 10 years ago, 10 years ago I had so much fruit. I was patient and I was kind and I was loving and I was doing this ministry and that ministry and I led this person to the Lord and all of these things were, were great. But you look at your life now and you say, well, I, I don't see any fruit. I love, that, I love that here the psalmist doesn't say that he is always bearing fruit. He's bearing fruit in its season. Well, friend, you and I don't control the seasons. You and I don't control the seasons. The Lord controls the season. That's why he's the Lord of the harvest. He decides when it's time for harvest. He decides when you're supposed to bear fruit, and he decides when you're supposed to be a little bit dormant. Dormant, not dead. Your life is sustained. You may just not have fruit. So you might look at your life and say, I don't have fruit right now. That doesn't mean you're not going to have fruit again. Doesn't mean anything about the fruit that you had in the past. Fruit grows in its season. God declares the season, not you and me. So you may look at your life. There may be sin and you, there may be all kinds of things. There may be fear. There may be, may be pain. There may be hurt. And it's keeping you, keeping you from that season. That's all right. The Lord will work through that. The Lord will work through that as long as you and I stay planted by that stream of living water. He goes on. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so but are like chaff that the wind drives away. The prophet Jeremiah and Isaiah actually both use this same imagery to describe God's blessing, that, that those who are, who are blessed of the Lord, who are righteous, who are planted in him, that they're trees, that they're growing productive trees. And Jeremiah, he describes people who are not rooted in the Lord, those who are against, opposed to the Lord. He describes them as, as trees that are planted or shrubs planted in the desert, that they produce no fruit and that they are withering. That's the other side of this picture. The picture of a life planted in the Word, the picture of a life planted in the Lord is growth, it's health, it's, 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 it's a tree. The picture of a life not planted in the Lord is withering. It is being disconnected from the vine and the fig tree. 
that story of Adam and Eve? Unfortunately, it doesn't end with Adam walking with the Lord in the shade of the trees. Now he's, he's cursed. His sin creates separation between him and God. And what is the curse that falls on Adam and Eve? Not just pain and childbearing, not just hard labor in making food from the ground. They are separated from the tree of life. The Lord wanted to separate him from that tree so badly that he placed an angel at the entrance to the garden so that Adam could not go back to it. He had a life lived in the shade of the tree, dwelling in the presence of God, and his curse is to be removed from it. When Jonah is having his pity party up on the hill, and he's having his pity party up on the hill, oh, poor me, I had to go deliver this message. I'm the most successful prophet in history, poor me. As he's up there feeling sorry for himself, and God grows that vine over his head, and he finally starts to feel a little bit better about himself, what does the Lord do? He takes it away. Why? He takes it away because he says, that vine is a symbol of my favor. That That vine is a symbol of my blessing, and you don't get it, Jonah. You think you're going, you think you're going to go and you're going to take my message, which is good, You're going to take my good message, you're going to take the gospel to these people, and you're going to hate them. You're going to have hatred in your heart to them. You're going to sit there in your sin and your your racism and your hatred for for my people, for my children, and you think I'm going to let you dwell in the shade of my vine? Think again, brother. That's not about to happen. And so the vine's taken away from him. And the fig fig tree is cursed. See, that's, that's life separated from the Father. That same imagery. And that's, as we unveil our strategy for discipleship training and discipleship growth, we're using a tree for that very reason. And that is that if we are connected to the Father, that we'll be like this tree, that we'll grow, that we'll, we'll develop, we'll bloom, we'll fruit in season. Verse 5, he again, he says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. He's saying here that those who choose to live a life apart from God, who choose to live this life apart from God, that they will not find a place in his people when the judgment comes. That they will not find a life in eternity with him if they have not chosen to live this temporary life with him. And then in verse 6, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord knows that way. Not only did he design the way of the righteous, he walked the way of the righteous. As Jesus dwelled among humanity, as he lived a morally perfect life, he walked this path of righteousness. And one of the beautiful things that we see throughout the scripture is that Jesus goes back again and again to the scriptures, that his life was planted by the living water of God's word. Even Jesus needed that connection. Now, there are a lot of spiritual disciplines. There are a lot of different ways that people express the ways that God is is forming them and shaping them, but the one that I see consistently again and again among every disciple is a connection to the word of God. Revelation 22, I think, maybe is the culmination of this. The culmination of this idea of of the tree. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding each fruit each month, The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be on it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. See, this is is it. This is the picture of the future that awaits those who have planted their lives by that living water. Graduates, I don't know your future plans, but do this for me. Plan on staying connected to this word. If you're not already, 
get connected to the word. Spend time with it daily. Spend time dwelling on its words, on its precepts. Let it be the thing that directs your path. As much as, as much as your parents, as much as opportunities, as much as you think God is opening doors for you, this will never lead you astray. This will never lead you wrong. Plant your life right here in this word. Even if you go to, a, to Tyler, even if you go to some horrible place like Tyler, <laughs> plant your word here. Plant your life in this word. No matter where Uncle Sam takes you, plant your life right here in this word. Friends, my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that we would be planted here. Not only because I like trees, not only because I like to spend some quiet time in a nice shady spot, but because I want my life to be like a tree that grows its fruit in its season. I want my life to show green leaves that are constantly alive and productive. That's the life I want. But that's the life I, I just want temporarily. The life I want ultimately is a life where there is no night. Is a life where I don't need the sun or the light because the Lord will be a light to me. That's the life that I want. And the way that I get there is by being connected through the word by the power of the Spirit, thanks to the sacrifice of Jesus. This morning, my prayer for everyone here is that you are connected to the Father this way. If maybe you have, maybe you have committed to following Him as your Lord and Savior some time ago, but, but something, there was a disconnection. Maybe there was a disconnection. Maybe the seed, the seed took root in your life, but, but something happened. It's not too late for you to get connected here. I pray that you will. Maybe you have never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never taken the step to plant your life the way that God wants you to. And if that's the case, my prayer is that his spirit would move in your heart today and that today you could begin a relationship with your heavenly father. Let's pray together. Our most gracious redeemer, we thank you for today and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the planting that you have done. I thank you for all of the work that you have done in Orange, Texas, in the building and establishment of this church and in the building of these believers. Lord, my prayer is that you would help us to continue to be planted and rooted in your word. Let this church always be a place where a gospel message rooted in your word is preached. Lord, we pray that if there are some who, maybe they have drifted away from you, maybe they have departed from your will in their lives, I pray that today would be a call to them to return. Because the water is good. The water is deep. Help them to be rooted back in your word. And Lord, if there's any here who doesn't know you as the savior of their lives, who doesn't know you as, as the one who loved them enough to die for them, I pray that your spirit would move today that they would plant their lives in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. If you would stand with me as we have a time of invitation.